But is that fair? Richard Bandler is certainly keen to stress the scientific approach of NLP, particularly his work with submodalities, where you increase or decrease the intensity of mental pictures, sounds or feelings to bring about a change for the better. We were very methodical about everything we did. We took groups of people with claustrophobia and jammed them into MRIs and taped them down and looked at what their brains looked like. And we studied every innovation in the field of neurology to find out how, how the motor cortex functions in relationship to the hormone system and the enzyme system and how neurotransmitters work. Every year, the neuroscientists come back and give me more information, and I relate it to behaviors that function and how they work. That studying the, the relationship between the, the function of submodalities uh, you know, the difference between the submodalities in sound and the submodalities in the visual system and the submodalities in the, in the variety of kinesthetic systems. With the advent of understanding the entemic nervous system, we know that what people call feelings actually has a whole brain of its own. The relationship between the neurology that functions between your intestines and your solid, and sor solid organs is as sophisticated as the neurocortex works. And understanding how to, how to consciously manipulate these things helps people to be able to make their lives so they function better, more efficiently. Um, you're using very impressive scientific um, terminology there, but I, I was under well, the you impression... You can look it up. I didn't make it up. No, I, I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I yeah. was um, under the impression that when L NLP was developed in the late 70s, there was a movement that was quite anti the scientific process. You well, know, it's not anti-scientific process. I went head to heads with social scientists. And my joke is, that, you know, you can get over all social diseases, including social science. They were hung up on a model called statistics. They made every poor psychologist to get his degree do statistics. And quite honestly, I've never had a client walk through the door that needed statistics. They don't need to change three out of four times. They need to change now. And, you know, the person with the phobia of elevators isn't phobic a certain percentage of the time. They're phobic all the time. And, uh, you know, over the years, I've developed technologies to teach people to control their brain so that they can alter their internal response and grow new cortical pathways. I asked Peter Kinderman, as a clinical psychologist, what he made of the neurology underpinning NLP. In some ways, NLP says things which cannot possibly be criticised. So, you know, the, we learn using neurological processes. Well, of course we do. Yeah, so there's a link between neurological processes, language and behavioural patterns that have been learned through life. I mean, of course we use neurological processes to learn. Of course we communicate with people using language. And of course, both those language patterns and the neurological processes that we use to guide us through life are shaped by our experiences. Life could not be anything other than that. But that's not quite the same as having a, a detailed theory about human emotions. As yet, the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy doesn't recognise NLP training on its own as a basis for accreditation. But a developing field, NLPT, or Neuro Linguistic Psychotherapy, has been trying to set professional standards and its own professional body is a member organisation of the UK Council for Psychotherapy. I asked Lisa Wake, a neuro-linguistic psychotherapist, about the difference between NLP and NLPT. Neurolinguistic psychotherapy is about the provision of psychotherapy using the principles, in other words, the ways of thinking that is encouraged with NLP, the attitudes, an attitude of being curious about a therapy client as opposed to judgmental about them. It's about utilising some of the tools and techniques within a therapeutic framework. So being a therapist in just neurolinguistic programming isn't enough? Not for me, it isn't. Some of the issues that come up, I think because I'm advisor and um, work on behalf of ANLP in voluntary capacity for some of their complaints processes, I tend to hear the stuff that's unuseful rather than the stuff that's useful. And well-meaning NLPers will provide interventions to individuals who have psychological distress or disturbance at varying levels, and those individuals actually end up in a more challenged place or a more difficult place or more uncomfortable place because of the intervention of a well-meaning NLP practitioner or master practitioner. I wanted to know whether Richard Bandler also thought NLP could be harmful in some cases. He rejected the idea, particularly in light of what he perceives to be the damage done to patients over decades by the mental health system. What they don't like is that there are lots of people out there getting lots of success and we're not using their techniques. You sound quite angry when you think about um, I'm pissed off, to tell Why you the that? truth. 
This is a field that has screwed with people for three generations that I know of. They've locked people up. They've drugged people. They've abused people mentally. They have people beating pillows and, and, and humiliating themselves. And they're telling me my techniques are dangerous. I've had to repair their work for four decades. This should be fun. Learning should be fun. And this is what we should be teaching people. I teach my paranoid schizophrenics how to enjoy overcoming their fears. So the idea that there could be any set of standards or There should be standards. Any... The standards sure. should be set by everybody. And the standards should be, is my client better today than they were yesterday? But some people are but unscrupulous. What? But some people are unscrupulous. People are making a lot oh, of money out of NLP. Excuse me, but you know, you know there are people that sell cars that are unscrupulous. Well, interesting. I, I, I actually did drive a car that was bad and I reported them to trading standards. If I went mm -hmm. to see an NLP practitioner who sent me psychotic, I wouldn't know who to go to. Maybe, maybe you, or maybe I could go to you. You could go to me. I'll go get your money back in a heartbeat. But see, if, if the psychologists and the therapists could actually set standards for themselves, then they can talk about my work. NLP has sometimes been compared with cognitive behavioural therapy, or CBT, a treatment often used in mainstream mental health care. They were both developed around the same time, but there's one big difference. CBT has a large body of conventional research to support its claims, while NLP does not. I would like to think that psychologists and psychiatrists who practice psychological therapies remain continuously linked to the developing scientific theoretical evidence base so that the techniques they use get integrated with new and other techniques as the theory develops. If the NLP practitioners were more linked to scientific methodology of clinical psychology, I think that applying the scientific method to some of the ideas of NLP could be very productive. Imagine that CBT wasn't put through the academic system to accumulate evidence. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine what CBT would be like today? Uh, I think it would look very much like NLP. There will be a combination of techniques that are effectively placebo. Visualisation or um, self-affirmatory statements can fit into that category. So, so people feel really good, but didn't really change their lives. There will be a few techniques that really work, like graded exposure, and possibly Socratic questioning of negative automatic thoughts would be really effective. But if CBT hadn't been through the academic and scientific process, if it wasn't still bedded to those clear links between theory and practice, then I think it would be a bit of a scattergun. NLP to me is not a form of therapy. It's not a self-help tool. Uh, I look at NLP as an evolutionary tool. And the people that are really doing NLP, as opposed to those people that are just using it for self-help things, are the people that are exploring how to improve the educational system. They're coming up with ways to make the best of people better. I think the best thing NLP offers is how to optimize athletes, how to optimize artists, how to get businessmen to function more efficiently. It does a lot of what psychotherapy was supposed to because we don't look at people as being broken, but we look at them as people who can learn if they're given the right tools. Maybe it's unfair to concentrate on whether NLP has the approval needed for health services funding. But Banler mentioned education, and as it happens, education is an area where research is attempting to underpin practice. It's the first time I've ever been at a teacher's NLP conference. As an advanced schools teacher, some of the buzzwords really going around. I'm just hoping to use the techniques I'm going to learn today in my teaching to become a more effective teacher, hopefully reduce the stress levels a little bit by using NLP. I see the benefit uh, in NLP in encouraging better classroom practice, but also for myself as a leader and influencing other people. How important do you think NLP is for teacher practice? It's another strategy that adds to a range of strategies that teachers should be aware of. As I've said to many people before, I don't train NLP accreditation, I'm a teacher. I'm fascinated by NLP, among other things, because it's so practical and so useful. Richard Church's isn't your average Richard Bannell or John Grinder devotee. He's never met either of the co-founders and works for the resolutely mainstream charity CFBT Education Trust, which ran the fast-track programme for teacher training on behalf of the government. 